La Lanterna, a spotlight in Italian football, is a podcast that dives into the beautiful game seen from the eyes of two fans from the oldest team in Italy's point of view. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, Canadian and Genovese, together with my friend Matt Killen, an American-born and Genoa fan. Every week, we'll tell you all you need to know about the only team you need to know about, Genoa CFC. Plus, we'll have guests and provide updates from around the magical world of Italian football. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to La Lanterna, episode number 18. It's me, Fabrizio Cardone, with my friend Matt Killen. Welcome, everybody. Fabrizio, it feels like it's been forever since we last spoke with the international break. I can't believe Genoa haven't been playing for more than a week. I know. And even though we even took a break, and that's probably also one of the reasons why it feels like so long, and uh, we apologize for whomever was waiting for some news and some podcasts about Genoa uh, or about the La Lanterna itself. But, um, you know, there there wasn't really much that happened other than the fact, of, obviously, which we haven't done yet to talk about uh, the last match, right? Genoa Modena. Yeah, of course. It's probably a distant memory in some Genoa fans' minds. But, yeah, you know, we don't have... Um quite the rumor mill anymore with the the transfer window kind of shut and um it, we've got some news i suppose to talk about on the international kind of break side of things we can talk a little bit about that yeah but uh you're right fabry i mean it's kind of like we're gearing up for the next match and the next match is against uh our our friends in uh ferrara Spau, so exactly so let's quickly talk i guess about uh, match day six Specifically, let's start, I guess, with our own Grifone. So, finally a win, I might say. Um, but again, a lot of controversy with respect to people in general. Not everyone. are. No, I wouldn't even say general. I, I'm going to call it 50-50 just because I don't know the numbers. Because when you go and read into the, uh, in the, in the uh, um, social media and whatnot, mm -hmm. obviously the biggest voice you're going to hear is the negative one. You're never going to hear the positive too, too, too much, other than the fact of saying to the more negative ones, they calm down, stop it, or, you know, stuff like that. Right. So how do you take that match? Let's talk about how do you take out of that and how what happened in that match? So let's talk about the last first, because I think we can then talk about the former part of like the reactions. So, all right, let's say you don't know a whole lot about the match. I think many of our, our listeners probably do. Of course, general general win one nil against Modena. Modena are not a big side, yeah. of course, in Serie B. So this is maybe a result that feels somewhat underwhelming if you're looking purely at the scoreline and you wanted to see a four next to Genoa and a zero next to Modena or something of that capacity. But so the match itself, I thought that. Um, from, from what I had seen in the match, and to be honest, I was also like catching up and watching more of the replay. Um, look, maybe we didn't exactly dominate, but we had a lot of great chances. I think you look, especially in the second half, there are a lot of chances there. We had a really wonderful goal, um, some great interplay with with Yalchin. I think Portanova was involved, and of course, Yagiello scores the goal. Um, and it was wonderful to see that, actually, that little link-up play that was very kind of not um, Ballardini-esque, I thought, from a, a goal perspective. Um, there were some maybe controversial uh, no-call penalties on our benefit. Um, I don't know, Fabri, if you if you feel the same way, but like, you know, there was the one, I think Dragushin might be involved with both of them. He's at least involved in one. They didn't call one because the player was already offside, which was the right call. There's another time where you know a player goes kind of down in the box. Maybe you could whistle for a penalty shout or something like that. Um, but like from my perspective, you look at the match itself. Uh, did we dominate the match in terms of you know exactly how we ended with the score sheet? No, we didn't. But I thought overall we did a decent accounting of ourselves personally. 
I mean, personally, how I sorry, go on. Just just to go through some of the stats of the match, you know, sixty five percent possession, usually in the dominant range. Twelve total shots to Modena's eight. Maybe you want to complain about Modena having eight shots. We have five shots on target to their two. Um, we had another three block shots, six corner kicks to their two. Um, I, you know, we had one shot that hit the woodwork. I don't know. I, I don't, I understand maybe some of the, the complaining, but it doesn't seem as obvious to me that this was a, a major sort of misstep on Genoa's side of things. 80% pass accuracy. Um, no, no, the stats are all there, Matt, and absolutely. And I, I actually think that the the game was well dominated by Genoa. Uh, basically, yeah. I don't see um, uh, at all uh, any type of um, possibility. I, I didn't see Martinez basically uh, have any major risk at all. Um, I think the only fact where, I guess, where it, it starts, and I'm using the quote-unquote, where the the um, Mogunio, <laughs> as we talked about it, is uh, has is started has started is essentially because they were probably expecting like a goal goal aid, right? Like um, maybe they heard our our podcast when I was saying I see a three nothing. Uh, essentially, there could have been a three nothing based could have on been, though. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, however, it didn't happen that way. But I still think that the domination was there. I still think that you know certain key players are still kind of working their way through to get to enter the the the, the starting 11 um, um and or anyways to get more minutes on their legs for that matter yep. um you know then there was a little bit of a forceful type of change because of the uh, ecuban that uh had uh, an injury just early before and, and and therefore that maybe he had prepared the match in a certain way and he had to go with the back uh, and plan B type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I saw that that match, sure, we had to wait until, what was it, the 44th, I think, minute in, yep. within the first half to see the first goal. But at that point, I was like, all right, that's what I was expecting. It, it, it arrived because I knew it was coming and right. it did come. Uh, second half saw we saw a little bit of uh, a lot a little bit more dominance uh, mm -hmm. some wake up call from Modena but it was very faint but overall sure we didn't do the 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 the, the three four two whatever people were expecting of goals but I think it, it was just like a clean clear no issues three points and that's essentially when I speak to all the city B people that, I, that I, we, we have been meeting throughout and whatnot yeah. they're all telling me hey take the three points take it home and don't worry about it because that's essentially what city b is all about it's it's like you know you have to make those points because it's not like uh city a with respect to the fact that it just like if we look at the standings um, when we have obviously now we can then we can also talk about it also but the the surprise is sort of the wake up of smaller teams of Regina and mm -hmm. Brescia but they're like at yep. uh, 15 points Frozenone. right Frosinone like that's another one that was yeah. not expected by anybody okay. um, 12 points uh, uh, with with body and then there's Genoa uh, a fifth spot or third with respect to ranking in, in, in points. Mm -hmm. And then you get the Cagliari. Inter what I'm trying to say with this is if, if you look up until the 15th spot, or let's even just be a little bit more conservative, up until the 12th spot, with um, which were, is where we have Cittadella, Ascoli, and Cosenza at the, at the same point, yep. this, these teams are in close range from first to, to, to 12th, what I'm trying to say, like well, in only seven points, right. you get 12 teams. So seven points are nothing, are, yeah. are not too much, not that much really. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's completely exact. It, that's the thing. We're coming into this division and, you know, it's, it's funny the whole deal. I know I'm, I'm going to be the outsider kind of complaining about this the whole time, but Going into the season, what were we saying? Oh, it's going to be really hard. Oh, you know, it's going to be grueling. We're probably not going to get a lot of great results. What if we stayed down? Um, you can't say that and then also expect that we just walk over teams like 4-0 all the time too, you know? Like, it's going to be challenging. And I think it's exactly right. Like, we take those three points. 
Um, and from my perspective, I think you're right. I, I think just generally, we were really on top in the match. It didn't end up in more than one goal, but if you even just seeing some of the chances we had, especially in the second half, there were there were two or three of those that probably should have been a goal. Yeah. So, like you know. honestly, to be honest, like maybe may a lot of people may might not agree with uh, with me or with us. I'm not too sure where yeah. you stand on this one. But um, I saw that dominance already, even with Palermo. So people were disappointed of the loss. Yeah, of course I would. I am too, right? Because it you you got no points back home. But um, the dominance is there. The presence is there. The only fear I have is, statistically speaking, mm. the Grifone after a national breaks does not come back with a shining armor <laughs> type of thing. So I'm hoping that that tradition kind of breaks now with the new, um, I don't know, new new management, new ownership, and new everything. Let's hope so. What do you think? Um, I I also hope that that's what we're going to see. I mean, maybe we should talk a little bit about the international break and the players that we saw involved there. I mean, I I would I, before I guess we do that. I I. Um, you know, we're getting players back. Maybe you have that disruption or something like that before the next match. But I think what has been pretty clear, and maybe this is what's been missing in previous seasons, is the direction in which um, Blessing wants to go with the club and the, what he wants to play and the style he wants to play. You're right. We played maybe slightly differently formation and, and players-wise last game than than maybe what some people were expecting. But we're still kind of in the realm of like that kind of style. So that continuity, I hope, is going to be something that players can just fall back into. Well, yeah. And, and, and to that point, I'm just, re- it, you, you, what you just said is just refreshed also my memory. While we were going apparently on this 442 or 4222 okay. model, et cetera, yeah. with the Ekuban off the pitch. Uh, we saw a uh, kind of going back to an old model that we have seen in the past, which is the four, three, two, one. I'm right. not a fan of that yeah. personally, but that's just a specifically a personal taste. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. It, it worked perfectly. Anyways, there was a four, three, two, one um, also from the modern side. So maybe it was the best approach to the match anyways. Right. Um, you know, the only disappoint in the only disappointment I have out of the match and I'm sorry because I think we have put a lot of um, of uh, financial investment into it. Is Yebwa? I don't know what's happening with the guy. Perhaps yeah. it's too much uh, media attacking going against him. Too much of a shadow of sort of like I don't want to call him Balotelli style, but you know, <laughs> a little bit full of himself type of thing. And I wish he was a little bit more humble like your friend group per se. And that's why he's always one of our biggest MVPs. And once again, he's like, I think he's like your fidelissimo, how we say in Italian, uh, of, of, of Blessing, like the one that Blessing would always use him no matter what, together right. with Goodmanson, mind you. But Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the Yebo stuff is concerning. It's, and it's kind of looked like that also for a few games, I think. Like he's come into these games he obviously had that that header against Venezia to start the season, and we were kind of all hopeful. They're like, okay, we just need somebody to get a start to the season against Venezia. Maybe we can have that player kind of continue momentum. And it sort of feels like a fluke a little bit. Like, he definitely should have scored um, in some of the other matches that we've played. I think he's left a goal kind of gaping when he had a free header outside of, you know, five yards away from the goal. So like those things have happened. And then you wonder sometimes a little bit about the discipline side of it as well. Like it's, it's something that um, I, I am really hopeful that we see a different part of Yeboa. I think at the end of the day, the good thing about this is that maybe not good for him. We do have a decent amount of players in his position, you know, in the squad. There are other guys we've not seen much of Puskas in, in the league yet. Um, Yalchin got the start and looked, I think, pretty good. He's had some other games in substitute where he's looked kind of, uh, you know, positive, at least in his contribution. So I'm with you. It's it's kind of a bummer with Yepua, but I'm not sure. 
I'm I'm hoping he's a sleeping giant and it's like going to be an explosion eventually. I mean, it's one of those things like you're always waiting for those players to come and why are they not waking up? I don't think management yeah. made the mistake to spend. I think it was what six point five million mm-hmm. to 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 get his uh, his uh, his the ownership of the player. Yeah, to own so I player. don't think. I'm I'm hoping they did not make a mistake because the quality is there, obviously, and there's no question about it. Yeah. Um, I just think maybe he just needs to be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more humble and more focused. Like I, I'd like to see him more like a skamaka, where it seems yeah. like that hothead, but he's super concentrated, super calm, super focused type of a, a, a player. And I think that's what he needs to uh, be a little bit more focused on my my take on it but anyways i, th- I like that well I, and i uh I, that that player trajectory would be absolutely incredible we ended up getting that type of performance out of him like we did with Kamaka a few years ago so. absolutely so yeah yellow goal scorer number seven i think out of all the players uh what do you think i i mean i kind of it's interesting seeing him score from that place because you were talking about again like the formation and so he's playing in that kind of outside position but in the goal and in other parts of the build-up play he almost looked like he was playing more like a wing which i thought was kind of interesting like he was in that box he was in that area and instead of being maybe like in the traditional lineup with a four three two one more sort of like i don't know if it's more holding or something like that he's obviously not a defensive midfield player but um i don't know i mean the guy can hit the shit out of the ball you know, we've seen this a couple of times. And I just thought that it was really clever. You know, he played the ball in, I think, initially to Yalchin. Yalchin plays it over to Portanova and Portanova back to him. And then just that quick combination play was fantastic. So it was a really fun goal to see. I yeah, absolutely. I think that scheme right there that you just described is one of those things that we were waiting for a blessings type of module to come through. Yeah. And I think that was the very first type of well played. Um, action per se that went to a goal actually yeah i agree we've had you know i I wouldn't say we've had a lot of instances like this before but there have been a couple where we've had good build-up play and we've not been rewarded and this one was kind of fun because you did have that energetic and electric sort of build up and then it, it ended the way you wanted it to end with an actual goal so exactly but um i don't know then we i think the back um with Voliaco, I still think that he's doing very well. Uh, yeah, um, such a talented young player. I'm super pumped about the fact that um, the team wanted to keep him and they're actually betting on him as well. Yes. And, and so it's like, I hope that injury type of thing did not happen um, uh, during the match when Bani had to came, come in. Yep. But um, I think... I think overall it's okay because nevertheless, good guy. Uh, we saw a little bit right. more minutes from uh, Strutman and Il Sanker just at the end. Yep. At least we're steer- starting to see them a little bit more. Um, Yebois, as we mentioned, but again, not much there. I don't know. Well, let's hope so. But the, the overall match, I, I, I cannot uh, say more than the fact that it was like a, a solid win, even though it was just only one goal. I mean, I think that's what it is. We play, we're playing at home. Okay, maybe you want to expect to score more than a few goals, but we were on top in every category. We had the shots. We have the goals. We had the key passes. We have the passing rates, like all of that stuff. We were on top. And we could we have maybe punished them a little bit more? Sure. Is that something we should do in the future? Yes. Is it going to be harder for us to win if we don't do that in the future? Okay, I, I I can get that point. I can understand that logic, but like, it it's I don't know. I, I think we're 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 poo-pooing it too much a little bit. Absolutely, and I think that's why this Mugunya is happening based on the fact of people just overanalyzing it too much. They want this, uh, as we say in Italian, the culture spumante, which is like that bubbly type of uh, football. Right. And it's not there right now. We're no. not in the right league. We're not with the right players. You know, it's a whole bunch of factors like that. I still think uh, that that part is so important. It's kind of like there was a specific transfer strategy. You know, we have to remember as fans going into Serie B. 
And this was this was specifically stated. I can't remember if it was Spores or or who had who had talked about this, but we really needed to invest intently on you know really experienced players. Some players perhaps who have study B experience, but more importantly, just players that really have experience in these types of very grinded out difficult seasons. And sure, a couple of players maybe for the future. But um, you know, we weren't signing in a way exactly to to get that type of fancy football team. We weren't even signing perhaps for the team that we think we're going to need in Serie A. You know, I, I think like if we get promoted this season up into the top division, and of course that's the goal. Um, it might be off of the backs of a totally different team that we take the the field in twenty twenty three. Absolutely, I agree with you. Actually, having said that, we're only a match six, but at least it's yes. starting to get shape and starting to get a taste of what it's looking like. What do you? What's your take on the actual top? I don't know, whatever number you want to put. Let's let's even rank it up until top, uh, I think it's what, seven or eight, um, where we have eight, I think, right? So the top two go straight through, and mm-hmm. then six go through the playoffs. Um, so let's look at the top eight. So right now, just quickly in order, Regina yeah. Bre- Brescia, Frosinone, yeah. uh, exactly, uh, Bari, Cagliari, Genoa, of course, Genoa, Cagliari, and Ternana, and last is Parma. The big ones that are out of this top eight before we proceed are obviously, I guess, Venezia for sure. Yep. And Pisa is another one, as they were like the contenders in the finale of the playoffs. Right. Um, and, and then maybe Palermo, I don't know, or, and or Benevento. Sure. Yeah. And, and or Cittadella is obviously someone that it, it's always like some contender for anyways for the playoffs. Right. But in these top eight, so when we quickly uh, look at, at them again, Regina, Brescia was part of the top eight uh, again from last year, but Frosinone, Bari, n- newly come from City G, right? Mm-hmm. Cagliari, Ternana, and Parma. So we're seeing Cagliari. We, we had this quickly, this conversation just before we went uh, live with the podcast, but we're seeing the other contenders, the main contenders, just below us it's really really close i mean and and that's the thing about the the league right now that's kind of interesting is like like you mentioned body are a point ahead of us there they came up from city chi last season calorie right behind us they're a point behind parma are two points behind um and it's again i i so my reaction to the whole thing i can't say with any like real um knowledgeable way you know, why we're continuing to see Regina and Brescia at the top three, why Frozenone is in the category at all. Um, but what I will say is obviously you've seen this pattern now for a few weeks with both Regina and Brescia, maybe to a lesser extent Frozenone and Bari, but both to, to those teams too, honestly, of them kind of holding on to their positions within the top five or six which I think is sort of interesting because, again, like to your point, we wouldn't really expect any of these sides to probably be in that place. Maybe Brescia is the one that's like the least surprising of that crew. So it goes back to your earlier point when we were talking <laughs> um, about some of the other challenges in Serie B is that there's not that much separating the sides right now, at least in terms of like purely a points basis. So um I, it is kind of fun, though, to see that because now the games at Regina, the games at Frozenone, they have a much more meaning than we're just going to Frozenone because we have to or whatever. So, no. And uh, mind you, like Regina, there's it's it's funny because Regina has a one negative thing and one positive thing to talk about them, meaning the yeah. negative is they barely made it to 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 be enrolled into City B this year. Barely. Right. They were, they were almost going bankrupt. Right. But the positive thing is their coach, which is Pipo Inzaghi, is known in, to Serie B and known to thrash mm-hmm. uh, the, the standings like throughout with their, the teams in, uh, that he has played with. Yep. So I guess that's what it is for them. Anyways, and we will be meeting them very soon anyways, if I'm not mistaken. The next one coming up, it, 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 we're gonna see 
let me see here. Where is it? Where did I put it? My apologies. Okay, so we have a spell, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have uh, in at home against Cagliari. Then at Cosenza. Then we're going to have a, a midweek uh, match of Coppa Italia again with Spal. Ternana mm -hmm. away. But then we're going to have Brescia and Regina, one after the other one. Yeah. Which and is... we have to get there with good points. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that, that's probably to your point, too. You know, it's, it's like uh, these matches are now all of a sudden critical matches. And it, for anybody that was maybe thinking this or wasn't quite sure, I had to look this at myself. Uh, people in Zaghi was the manager for Brescia last season when they had had a good showing within Serie B and were kind of, I thought, somewhat unlucky not to be promoted to Serie A. So, um, you know, I, I think these matches now going up against uh, Regina, going up against Brescia, especially coming out of the break, we, it's important we get at least four points out of that, I think. Don't, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. At, at a bare min, not to yeah. mention the next one coming up. And uh, Cagliari in Genova was going to be another tough one anyways, right? Right, exactly. So I guess before we go into more, uh, a little bit more about the match uh, against Pal, uh, I wanted to quickly, we mentioned that uh, we were going to talk about um, some sort of like a lineup of what the Calcio Mercato brought to. So we, you, you mentioned the fact of that the, the imprint was more about the, the, the winning this uh, this season rather than in much investment for next season. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what what's your take on on the actual culture mercato? I thought it was um, interesting also to see that that kind of news as well. I mean, for us and for the um, for Genoa and, and and what we're going on there. I mean. On our squad, obviously, like we're not seeing, I, I don't think necessarily we're going to have a whole lot of massive, massive changes between now and between the the, the match and Spal. And I'm curious your thoughts on this one too. Um, but I think, you know, looking at what's going on and, and what we're seeing also in the international kind of friendlies, it was also good to see some of our, our guys get on the score sheet and see some of um, those positive performances during the, the international break that hopefully will carry over into the next matches and beyond in Serie B. So, um, and I, you know, some of the guys we saw, I think some Genoa fans of course have seen, uh, I think friend had scored a goal for Denmark, which was great. And, and I believe Puskas did two for Hungary. Am I mistaking that? Was he, he two, two goals? Two goals. Yeah. Um, so br brought Rom Romania a little bit back Romania, up. Romania. Thank you. Sorry. Not Hungary. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Different Puskas I'm thinking of for the Hungarian team, <laughs> for Real Madrid, I think, a long time ago. No, uh, but uh, uh, no, both of them did very well. Um, I don't know. I think Goodmanson was actually not called up. If I'm not mistaken, he was not called up just for punishment. Imagine that. Oh, really? Yeah. For the the four game ban thing. Well, it's a three-game ban, which, good that you brought that up. We did a recourse, and we actually won that recourse, so he is going to be available for spot. Thank you. I don't. I still don't understand what was behind that ban. I don't know, because I don't know if he knows that much of Italian and whatever. He said, I don't know how much was understood. <laughs> he was right? one of those so, translation things. He thought he was saying some, some like, curse word and could be, called could somebody be. something, like, actually, like, really problematic. <laughs> could be, could be. <laughs> People were telling him, hey, say this in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat that again? Um, I, I don't I and I think it's slang is, like, nothing comparable to the Latin-based languages, so there's, like, whatever yeah, it, it's either it. one of those words that he, you learn first words that you learn when you come to italy you know like those figlio di puttana i don't know something like that <laughs> yeah, right right <laughs> that, that totally what i'm picturing in my head is he's, he's saying some something uh along along those lines i don't know if we're censored or not in this podcast so i won't say the exact words but uh <laughs> i like to think that that's what happened and that's why i got suspended most likely anyways but yeah but no, about the the the, the, the national break, definitely. Um, you know, Italy, if I may say, has shown a little bit of better colors, so that's yeah, a good thing. Yeah, yeah uh, has and it, actually they have 
relegated. England. Died. Yeah, I was about to say. Uh-huh. I, the the whole Nations League format is so hard for me to follow, but seeing England at the bottom of that group was kind of satisfying. So, Which is kind of interesting for you guys, because if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's in your group, right? Yeah. For the World so, Cup? Yeah, Fabrice talking about the, the USA. Uh, yes. So our group, we have, we have England, Wales, uh, and Iran. And it's it's just kind of like, I don't know. We've been shit talking them for such a long time. The the funny kind of memes have basically been like, if England starts with Harry Maguire at center back, we have a chance. If they don't start with Harry Maguire at center back, we don't have a chance. <laughs> I, I still generally think that's right, but their form is terrible. I think they're um, they've not won a game in like six matches or something, which is the first time that that's happened since like the nineties or something like that. Um, insane. It's not a good way to, and I think that was the last preparatory match too, wasn't it? That's the last one. So then the next game they're going to be playing is going to be an actual World Cup competition game. Yeah. Uh, well, is, they, is, is it? Right? No, they might have some friendlies because there's another international okay. break sometime in November. Um, I know Italy will go into the final four. Um, That's, yeah, in the Nations League, yes. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. In, and no, the other ones I think they're just going to do if, especially for whoever goes to the World Cup, they might need some more minutes to 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 train and whatnot, right? So I, I think there's just going to be some friendlies. Um, yeah, so, in, well, you talked about England's form. I don't want to really talk about too much about uh, national teams, but because there's so many podcasts that are going to cover it, but still, mm-hmm. let's look at it from our perspective. U.S.'s shape, how do you think about that one now? Uh well, there's this is kind of like the big debate of what's going on right now is like, should we be playing actually with like a false nine and doing something like that? I mean, I I have a lot of problems with what's going on with with the U.S. national team and what we're doing. Um, I'm I'm a big uh, fan of of Jordan Sibachu, who plays now in the Bundesliga for Union Berlin, who I don't think really even featured in the last two games. I actually don't even know if he was called up, but it's just not working. You know, we don't have the right kind of ability to advance the ball from the midfield. And we're trying to do the same thing from the back of the pitch with our center backs. And these guys have played mainly in in the MLS on the center back side. And so we're just getting these shit turnovers all the time. So I don't know. I I think formation wise, I kind of, I don't mind that idea. Um, And it's, you know, it also is going to depend a little bit, like apparently Reyna maybe hurt himself again after just coming back which was a massive blow for us. Um, but I, what, we're, I'm not a fan of what we're running today. I'll just say it that much. So do you think it's going to be tough or it's going to be easy to get at least the top two spots? I don't, I'm not putting anything past these teams. I mean, I don't know very much about Iran, but I believe they were one of the better sides in, in their Asia slash Oceania group. Asia. And maybe you like laugh at that and say, okay, well, they're playing Fiji and, you know, whatever. Um, actually, I don't even know if they're in the same, I think they're in the same division, which is nuts. Um, but you know, this is a team that has kind of been able to be tricky sometimes before. Um, I don't know if we get past Wales very easily because they've got the talent and they're going to be so motivated because it's the first time they've been in the World Cup in more than 60 years. So everyone's gonna be ready to play that game. And for them, the achievements already made it, you know, if Wales don't make it out of that group, People in Wales aren't coming back saying, I can't believe you guys didn't make it out of that group. I want my Wales shirt back now. I'm not a Wales fan anymore. <laughs> um, if the U.S. don't make it out of the group, someone's getting fired. Like, it's just like how it's it's going to be. Like, it's that's the expectation. And so that's kind of part of the other thing that I worry about is we're going to be playing. Um, everybody's buttholes are going to be super tight when they're playing these World Cup games. And you've got one of those games against England, which is one of the better sides in, in the world. You've got at least one world-class player on the Wales side of things that you have to, to contend with. And then, you know, Iran's the wild card. So I'm not actually very optimistic that we get out of the group based off of what I've been seeing and kind of how the other teams look, but hopefully I'm wrong about that. On the Canadian side, uh, I know a little bit less than what you have just described about the U.S., but I know it's going to be super tough. Um, within the friendlies, we saw a nice match against Qatar, but they had a wake-up call, and I think it was well, um, t- good timing. 
yeah. which they played against Uruguay, which is a 13th ranked team, not to forget, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, big, so big, the big loss game. was two nothing uh, for, for 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 Uruguay, the win. Yeah. But um, you know, it's a good wake up call, as I mentioned to you, uh, for the for the for the squad, and just to you know put their feedback down on the ground for whomever was thinking was going to have like a not necessarily an easy but a chance so you, you're going to have to sweat it because the group having belgium there in a reborn croatia i don't know if you've seen some of their matches but what the heck is going on with that team it almost seemed like a dead um yeah. you know when they call the gen- next generational thing and so on and it was like almost like dying there but they're rocking it right now I've I've been following them more passively, but it, it does look like they've been getting those numbers together. And I think there are like a couple of more young Croatian players that are starting to make a name now. So maybe that that trust on I've, again I've not been following so much is part of why they've had some some success lately. But uh yeah, it's gonna be you guys have a tough group, I think. Uh, and then the last one is Morocco, right? Morocco. So that's like a very has always been a, a tough um uh, African say, side. A tough group. He's like, well, hold on, we, there is Morocco. But I agree. Morocco is not an easy out either. You've got good defensive players in that team. Yeah. So, so, I mean, the first match is going to be against Belgium, and that's going to be super interesting anyways to get the least possible goals. I guess that's what the goal is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah, so going back to Genoa, so a, a few players did very well in the friendlies from friend group, as we mentioned before. Um, we talked about Puskas, um, our, a former player, uh, even with Puskas, was also... Radu, Andre Radu, mm-hmm. the goalie. And uh, I don't know. Um, there is chances there uh, of getting maybe more call-up. Maybe if uh, uh, Gunmundsson doesn't uh, swear in Italian anymore, maybe he can make it uh, for the World <laughs> Cup. No, the World Cup, they're not going to make it. For... Anyways, uh, what was I going to say? So that was the international break. Now we have the actual return to match day seven. Yes. And against Spal. So, Spal. So quickly, sorry, quickly talk about Spal. So what happened with Spal is the last match they had, I, I, again, their form is not that great. Um, they're sitting on the ninth spot, though, so it's not that like that bad, considering. Mm-hmm. They're just one point. No, actually, the same points of Parma. Uh, their okay. shape, their form is uh, tie, win, tie, win, tie. So the last one was a 3-3 against Como. 3-3. That's right. That's right. Which is, you know, can it's mixed feelings that you can think about how that match happened. But, anyways, um, Spal, what do you think about Spal? I mean, this is another game. Look, I, I know that I don't like, for the sake of, you know, jinxing our team, having us be the favorite and all this other stuff. But this is a game that does feel like we should win. And you're right. Um, from the standpoint of like the table, we're not really all that far off from Spa, from Spal, who I keep wanting to say it like a German word or something like Spal. Um, that's not how you say it at all. Um, they're two points behind us. It's not like Spal are like really so much worse off. I look at the draw against Como as actually a red flag um, on a Spal fan perspective because you're going to this team that is maybe one of the poorer ones in in all of Serie B, and then you manage a measly draw against them, and you allowed three goals against Como, um, I think that it's something that is there's a bit of a red flag. Um, but, you know... They did know. win against Venezia, the one before that, too, right? Yes. Yeah. So... They draw know. with a body before that. They won against Cagliari with that double red-carded... Double red-card game. Yeah, one nil, and then I think they they did lose to Regina at the beginning of the season, but actually that one doesn't look as quite as bad now. Obviously, going into the match day seven, just because Regina's top, and also Regina has has had um, multiple kind of goal scorers come into that squad. Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, yeah, it's go not going to be an easy match, that's for sure. Yeah, it's it's away, so that's another factor. That's, yep, yeah, fair to mention that. Um, obviously it's not far, but it's still away. Um, I, I think that the spots for all the fans got sold out in a matter of seconds. Yeah, they well. asked for more, but you know, the Spal's, um, um, stadium is, I can't remember what's the, 
capacity in there, but you know, <laughs> it takes just two seconds for us, I guess, to to fill it up, especially if it's just like a three, four hour drive away. Right. But yeah, so let's talk about the formation. What do you think we're going to get into that? Like wh what's going to happen there? Well, on the Genoa side of things. So um, I'm glad you mentioned friend rope because I think that does change the dynamic a little bit. And I don't know very much about Acubon. Did you status. mean Goodmanson? Or sorry, I'm sorry, Goodmanson. Yes, thank you. Um, so Goodmanson kind of coming back into the squad. Um, I mean, it. I'm kind of two ways about it. Again, I, I still, I think it might be the four two 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 return. Um, you know, we, you and I both know that there was a lot of uh, four three two one played prior to that. So, you know, is it a major departure? I'm not sure. Um, I do think we see Goodmanson in the starting lineup. Um, I mean, the the question kind of that's interesting about it is like, what does the midfield look like? Because you have to have friend up in the lineup. Like you mentioned, like he, this is the one of these guys. Like, this is basically Blessing's first name off the team sheet now. Is is friend Um, I think you kind of have to have Badel on there. Um, and then the rest. He's of tired, though. Yeah, he's, he's a little tired. Who would you Who would you want to have come in for him in in the midfield? Do you think? I don't know. Some people like if I think about. Last was the last two years ago when we had uh, Sturtman uh, coming in at January. Um, yeah. They played very well together, but a lot of experts are actually saying that they're a duplication uh, between the two of them. So maybe one is for the other in the event in the training, he's not showing as much as well as good. I mean, I, we've not seen a ton out of Sturtman this season, which I, I'm I'm pro that. And, and, you know, we also have, doesn't, I guess we did bring, brought, um, Bill Sanker on as his replacement, um, in the last match. So uh, those are probably the two names that you think about who are available that could come in in place of him. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of feel like Blessing's going to be a man of, of principle in a way. He's mm -hmm. going gonna to continue to play the players that have kind of been in his core, but, I, I hear you on him being a little bit tired. I mean, he's also not the youngest guy in the team by far. In fact, I think he's probably one of the oldest. Probably, team. yeah. Um, no, we're not talking about 50 years old, 40 no, years old. but <laughs> No, but still, I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. The, the forward part of it is semi-interesting, although I don't expect any massive kind of shockwaves there. Coda has still not been the goal-scoring machine for anybody who's out there saying, we bought the school goring champion of City B. Where is that? We're still not getting that from him. I think that's harsh you know, in a response to his play because I do think that he offers more than just scoring goals. But Totally agree. I think it's a little interesting. Does he start? I think he probably does. I think that's, that's going to happen. But I'm still like semi-curious about whether or not that's the case. No, it's, it's a good point. And I think also this factor of, well, first of all, he's a complete player. We already talked about him. I think he's like your, not only your pure number nine, but he also get, goes and gets the ball, which a lot of people are saying, that's wrong. He shouldn't be able to have to do that. But honestly, I don't think he has to do it. I think that's just the kind of player he is, like a complete player. I agree. Right? And yeah. I think the issue is that now he has that burden of thinking, mm -hmm. uh, they got me because I because have to score, the goals. because I've been capo canoniere for two years in a row, right? And, and now I have to perform. It's time for me to show, and it's not happening. What what the hell? And you know that pressure, right? And I hope that he is, you know, wise enough not to fall in that trap, a psychological trap, and whatnot. Last match. I have to say that probably one of the lesser good players was perhaps Koda, but not necessarily because he didn't score. He was just like a little bit more off or perhaps sometimes people don't remember or forget, sorry, I should say that a lot of times strikers are not doing well because they're super well marked. Like the defenders are doing their proper Thank job. You. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been one of the hypotheses, right? Is like, if you're an opposing manager, and you're looking at this Genoa side, what are you going to tell your players? Let's not let... Stop Porter him. Score. Exactly, stop him. Let's try to have Whatever. Manolo Portanova score. And they say, okay, fine. We can we can live with Manolo taking 
35 year yard shots outside the box or something like that's that's okay he's not going to make very many of them and it, likely we were going to get the ball turned back over or something like that so you know i i, I get i get the thing and by the way i'm not picking on portino at all I, I just think that like um you're right to point out that he's probably also getting the best from opposition teams um as they're preparing that that has an effect on on what he's able to do yeah um it it, it, it again one good thing about what uh, Blessing has done so far mm-hmm. is to be the great Uomo Spogliatoio, which uh, he pumps up the, the locker room. He, like, okay, one other thing that I actually, did, by saying this, it, it just remembers, uh, it reminded me about something. Even though we might not have seen the goleada, as we say in Italian, like with a number of gazillion goals and whatnot, mm-hmm. you can say that this team is tight. They're, they really are pumped together. They're inciting mm-hmm. each other. They're really, you know, happy to play with each other. So I don't see like issues in the locker room. I don't see right. players hating one versus another. Right. They're all like, you know, pumped together and they're all happy for each other. Like, look, even when Yagiello, or I, I was listening to the, um, to the, to a British um, commentator and he was <laughs> call, calling it Yagiello or something. Maybe Yagiello. I'm wrong. So I, maybe I'm wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I'm know. I'm not that wrong. I have no idea. Anyways, so I was like with my girlfriend right there and saying, okay, he's not going to say that name again, is he? Yeah, yeah, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it's so whoa. funny. <laughs> That's what you're from now on. No more yags. It's going to be yeah, yeah, whoa. Exactly. <laughs> but no, um, what do you, what, what type of formation do you think you're going to, we're going to see? Like, do you, do you think we're going to, I know we talked about it a little bit just two seconds, a few seconds ago, but who do you want to see? Let's put it that way. Who do I, ooh, who do I want? Okay. This is a different kind of proposition. I mean, can we do some good old fashioned football and play some old four, four, two? I mean, that'd be kind of fun. That would be fun. We saw I, that a little bit with, uh, with Blessing. Yeah, he's done that a bit already. I mean, I think our back four is more or less set right now. I guess you're right to say, like, is it Voliaco or is it Bonnie? Um, At the very least, that's the only change I would see. Yeah, right. Um, so let's go with the mid four. So the mid four, again, friend up right off the score sheet. Okay. I think Goodmanson is going to be left on the wing. Yep. Um, you know, right is kind of interesting. I think it is going to be Yagiello. You could make a case for Portanova. I think this is one of the things with the 442, you know, maybe actually lose out on the player in, in that sense. Um, I do think probably it will be Badel as Friendham's partner in the, in the middle of the park. I would like to see Ilsanker in this role from the beginning just to start. Um, you know, he's a player that has that capability to hold the ball up. I think he's also known. Um, of course, for his defensive prowess and his ability to kind of um, also pick out players. And I'm curious to see, you know, we, we gave him some time in center back and, you know, more defensive opportunities. And um, I, I just want to know kind of what that possibility looks like. And I think from a, a, a striker pair, I mean, this is where it, it's kind of curious. And I, I, I wonder if this is too many of the same player. Uh, I think you're definitely starting Coda. Don't imagine a world where Coda is not starting. Um, is it Puskas? Is it Yalchin? I, I kind of like Yalchin there, even though maybe they're going to be crowding on each other a little bit. Um, I really like what I've seen from him so far. So um, that's my hope, anyway, is that we line up that way with that four four two and and um, those players. Actually, I'm gonna. Uh, add, I, I'm. I'm second. I'm. I'm like totally with what almost everything you just said. <laughs> I'm. I can probably add a couple of things more. Mainly also because I heard a few interviews uh, from okay. different uh, um, journalists from the Italian side. Um, definitely, the four four two seems like a viable option. Yeah. Um. And like no joke. The the other option they were thinking about or heard anyways, but I think it's a little bit too aggressive as an option would be the four three three. I agree. Um, I'm a little bit worried about us getting beat on the counter attack or something with something like that. I'm not sure if we're drilled well enough to know how to move in and out of that that four three three. Exactly. No. Exactly. Um, but I think it's going to be a four 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 two again. 
I think the fa the, the, the back four, obviously, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just exactly in sync with what you just said. Mm -hmm. The mid, um, I think you're right too. I think Yegewo <laughs> is in super shape. <laughs> so I don't think he's, I think he's going to be the starting there. Um, uh, and on the left, I absolutely agree with you that Goodmanson is going to come back unless, unless uh, Blessin is going to, you know, give him a little bit, I don't know, of, um, you know, a little bit of tough time for what happened. I don't know yet. You know, remember, let's not forget that uh, Blessin is German, so he might be a little bit more harsh type of thing, right? right? Yep. Um, which is possible but let's let's assume that he is not he's going to be starting right uh the mid two of the out of the four i agree with you it's going to be friendship and badel and or perhaps yeah maybe i see badel at the beginning and then he's going to be subbed maybe sometime in the second half perhaps soon after the second half maybe at the second half depending on badel's um type of shape at that point um, and then the top two, uh, the front two, sorry, it's going to be coded, no question about it. But the rumors say it's going to be Puskas. I think that from the, could be, from the starting. That could be interesting. I mean, obviously, we've not really seen Puskas play, but he seemed to play well in a, in a, in a two-striker setup before in other, in other squads. Um, and maybe his pairing with with Coda unlocks something else that we could see. Um, so, I like it. I, I, I'm I'm kind of with you too, Fabri. Like it'd be nice to see, see something a little different. We've seen this four two 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 thing. I know the four four two isn't in concept all that different from it in terms of where the players are going. But let's see if we can find that mix. And look. I know we've been kind of giving fans a hard time the last few weeks because of the reactions to some of the games and stuff, but there's definitely some truth to the fact that like, we all want to see Genoa really dominating more or in a bigger way than they have been. And maybe we just need to find that better combination. So we'll see. Okay. That's a good point. And that actually, let me do a little bit of the owl here. Like we say in Italian, like goofo, but I'm not saying to, to do a, um, a jinx it or anything, but yeah, let's think about if we lose. Okay. Which I'm not saying it's impossible. Unlikely. Maybe. I don't know if it's just because on the paper, let's put it that way. Okay. Sure. Let's don't be like full of ourselves. But on the paper, it's unlikely. But let's say it did happen. Yep. Do you think those rumors that people are starting to have started uh, of talking about that this coach is no good for Genoa is going to actually happen? You mean with a loss? You mean do you think with a loss he would be impacted from his job, or do you think it's going to actually be an indication that we need to change? I think you're asking the first. The, um, I don't think so. I, I I mean, it's curious. And there were obviously like there were some um, misalignment things that were happening over the summer too, if you believe the rumors about, um, you know, some of the, you know, bringing back gasp and stuff like that, which... That's just BS from a journalist, very unfamous journalist in Genova. But if you, if you kind of, if you read anything into that, and you believe that there's a part of the camp in, in Genoa that we're thinking in that realm of maybe we do need to change something that makes for more sense for me to think that maybe there's credence to a rumor like this, where people are saying, Hey, this guy's job could be on the line. I don't see that. I mean, here's the thing, as much as I'm saying we should beat Spal as I think we should win this game is I'm going to be really disappointed if we don't. They are literally two points behind us in the table. And losing right now, like there's a much bigger risk at the moment because like you've mentioned, like the players are kind of um, rallying together. It seems like we're getting, there's a, it seems like the players are buying into Blessing's direction mainly. We're not necessarily seeing that result translate into absolutely ridiculously dominant performances, but we are also like set up for, a, a way to make a really good run at those automatic playoff spots. And and it's way too early to say that stuff. So I don't think so, but 
now I'm going to use the, the Uno flip card and put it back to you. Like, what do you think about this whole thing? Do you think there could be an instance where maybe he is out of a job if they lose this game? I don't know. Um, I think it's, it's interesting uh, because it could go anywhere. I personally think 777, which are the owners, of course, um, are a little bit more careful on what they want to do. Um, they understood very well the mistake, the mediatic approach that they had with Shevchenko, that was, mm -hmm. which was just jumping the gun too fast. Yeah. And I think that before they make any type of careful or you know dangerous decision it's it's going to be very very well thought through so having said that do i think it's shaking his position his job his uh, bench itself no i think that un the unfortunate part is that journalists and especially fans alike have been <laughs> used to too many coaches coming through our way I, we said that already and I think we just have to get unused to that. And instead of saying, okay, two, three games going bad, let's change it, you know, let's stick with it. And, and, and you know, let's, let's make it happen uh, because the point is we pick that coach in order to do a project and let's go through with that project. It is, it is so funny and, and, and spot on, you know. It's like we can't pretend like we're Chelsea and we just have this – squad of players that all cost 80 million that we can somehow pay also their salaries for like we have a, a good better than average side in city b and we should be a lot more than just a better than average side in city b um i don't know i i, I just think that we've got to be careful with the whole thing absolutely and i don't think they're going to make that same type of mistake I don't either. again. Yeah. I don't yeah. think so. Um, so I think most of it is just rumors. Obviously, if we get to, until uh, up to the next break, um, a, a, a whole bunch of you know miss point missed points and so on. So for example, um, we said Spal, then we have Cagliari, then there's Cosenza, then the uh, l forget about the Coppa Italia one, but then there's Ternana. So let's say that in these matches, before we get the, the duo, Brescia and, and Regina, and we're not going to make, I'm just like telling it up a little bit. So one, two, three, F in these four matches, in, in which one of them is with Cagliari, if we're not going to get what? Nine, po I would say at least 12. Not, and no, it's, it's possible. Maybe nine, uh, nine, 10, perhaps full-fledged 12 i don't know yeah i mean I, th I think you're right too like if if it if it happens we start seeing those losses really pile up then it be, or the the drop points pile up it you raise i mean no i don't think anybody is really certain that we are on the perfect path with this blessing journey that we're on i think there's there are encouraging signs that i don't think that we're at a place where it's been poor enough where firing after five or six matches makes sense and, uh, you know, with the identity of the team being what it is, I think there's a bigger risk there. You got a lot of players who came in and they're maybe came in because of, um, you know, even before the, our, some of our transfer windows that we had uh, last, last season and, and last, last January. Um, but we're, we have a direction with this manager and we, we can't deviate from that. That's, that's kind of how I feel. And if it, we need to deviate, if it's, becoming clear that if we don't deviate we're not making our goal and I don't, I don't think that's clear at all right now we're the best position side out of any of the promoted out of any of the relegated sides and um you know we've not yet to really play these teams in the top five um so you know if we play these teams and they look like they're outclassing us that's a different conversation that we're having than, than let, let, let me add one more piece to the fire and I'm just, okay. I, I kind of know where you're going to answer, but I, I just want to put it out there because more and more comments, I'm hearing people saying mm -hmm. on the defensive side, rather than on the attacking side saying, are people doing the Mogunio because the coach is not Italian? I mean, I, I think there's probably an angle of that for sure. 
I mean, this was part of the thing that had happened when we got relegated too. We have a big, huge, I mean, you consider this, I think there are a number of reasons why this was maybe disadvantages, disadvantageous, but also look at the players who are performing right now for us in City B. January transfer window, how many players did we sign? How many of them were Italian, you know? Um, and there was kind of this feeling that like, well, we didn't have enough players to even understand the language. So how could they have been any good? And it, it just like, I uh, I think I'm sure there's actually truth to people thinking that that's the case. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things you almost don't have to, you shouldn't pay mind to because it's out of your control type of a thing. I think that I agree with you. I still think that people are too used to like the old culture yeah. where I'm thinking about back in the eighties, nineties, when you were not able to have more than three foreigners. And that was uh, independently from the e European union. Right. You just could not um, assign more than three players. And they're probably still used to that. That has a flip side on a national team, and and we agree with that. I think there should be some restructuring, especially yeah. with uh, trying to emphasize emphasize a lot more not only on the Serie B, which I think is super super under evaluated, uh, especially from the Fiji Chi, which mm -hmm. is the governing body from the cultural perspective, mm -hmm. but but also um, the youth talent itself. But um, I mean. Let's get let's 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 look at even like the top teams in Syria. How many Italians are there, really? Right? Yeah, I mean, and just because a foreign coach has played in Italy in the past, it has become an Italian, naturalized Italian. That's fair, rather than a coach that is per, barely speaking Italian. In some interviews, he's starting to say some words, so that's a good. Well, sign yeah, I know. Like I, I get a little bit maybe if you're you've been in in Italy for almost well it's not been a year yet so he's not quite in the place where you can learn it but no I mean you're totally right like some of yes you do have managers of Italian descent in Syria and some of them are leading some of the bigger sides in Syria yes of course that's happening but I don't know I I, I get why people would want to make the argument. I don't agree with it, but I know we're aligned. I don't agree with it either. But that. perhaps it's also because we live living abroad, living in two major cities, two super multicultural cities. It just does not make sense from us, from our perspective, anyways. Different background. That's all it is. So before we go to, um, so there's no, we're not going to have any break this uh, this episode. I think mm -hmm. most have uh, understood that. Unfortunately, our guest was not able to make it, so. We're totally hyped anyways to do just the, the two of us and everybody listening to us. So they are our guests always anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> so before I ask you what's your uh, predictions for next match, yep. um, you mentioned a little bit about the, the jersey, the kit that uh, when you had hands on to it and whatnot. I got a little bit curious about it and I'm, I've, I've been reading a little bit more about it. This whole thing about the replica that it says on the on the website um, that, by the way, is managed by Castor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not managed by by, by Gino anymore. It could be a choice, a, a marketing choice. Why then is a replica, an official replica, mind you, but still so expensive? It's bad. So like anybody that didn't hear or maybe doesn't remember. So I, I got my brother the home shirt for this season as a birthday present i was really excited to get to present it to him you know the colors are great surprise surprise it's the same colors we always have but the badge itself is printed on there like a sponsor is and yeah you did say that you wash the thing it's gonna fall off and it's just crazy like the 60 dollar cost seemed like hey this is a decent deal there's no sponsor thing on it like you get the, the shirt a replica version but like i'm sure it's fine enough from an athletic standpoint i don't need to be wearing the one that's like officially the player player one do you think it's a castor thing to do the replica versus no. the official i don't i well i i think i th like you mentioned before somebody fucked up basically and there are a lot of like rushed decisions that were made i don't think it was a 
intentional decision to have Castor run our site. I don't think that's a long-term decision. It just seems like a strange thing to do. I mean, we could maybe have cut budget in that instance by, you know, firing the the team that is managing that today or that was managing that today. And I, by the way, I thought our old store was 10 times better than the Castor one, mainly because the Castor one only has the home away and third kit in men, women, and children. Nine yeah. items plus the, the, the shorts and that's it. Yeah. And it's just like, guys, come on. It's, it's, we're in October now. So I, I think there's a lot of decisions being made to cut corners and just, it, it's, it's a shitty experience on, on our side. I guess so. I, and I have fortunately has to, I have to agree with that. It's sad to say, but unfortunately, um, yeah. The other side of the city, if it is still part of the city, <laughs> I'm kidding anyways, but um, yeah, they're not going through very well. Um, and I just want to quickly mention the I fact that this. I, I checked on the table earlier and uh, I re I'm really enjoying it just because of how much they enjoyed us suffering and now them being in the same. No, actually, it's not the same because we no. were still in a good shape financially over there in that side. It's absolutely not. And I mean, Hey, too bad, so sad type of thing. Oh, well, <laughs> too bad for you. I'm no, not crying uh, any tears about, about No, none, none, none at all. And um, even though whoever's not a Genuano fan that is actually following us might say, hey, yeah, that's not too nice to say, et cetera. But no. you know what? Too bad. Uh, too bad but I am bad. super rooting for Paladino. I just wanted to mention the fact that Paladino took over as a manager at Monza. They won amazingly uh, last uh, two weeks ago and I'm hoping it's going to be a strike to have the second win and because Paladino being an ex uh, Genoa uh, the, the famous uh, duo together with Milito and he was like being a he was perfect it was wonderful I remember him and so I wish him very well um, with uh, with Monza I uh, it's good to have a side to root for a little bit in in Syria you know um Berlusconi. Yeah, the Berlusconi. He's gonna stay, yeah, yeah, is he gonna stay afloat? Better him than someone else, right? <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm I'm with you on that one. So going back to, to City B, so the next uh, um match day seven is gonna be quite interesting, I think. Um, but it's important for us that we're gonna have to do the best that we can. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, to not in order not to fall behind, essentially, right? We need to get the win. I, I do believe that. Um, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it should be something that we it, we can do. I don't think it should be something that's within out of reach or that we get outclassed or something. If those things are happening again, things right will be more concerned. But we we need this win because, as you mentioned, there's just a very small uh, gap between um, the top of the division and. And, um, you know, the middle or even like the lower parts. So our little Cinderella is doing very well, by the way, the Sutirol, like from last in the, in the league. Now they're like 15 spot with seven points. Who would have thought that? Not bad. Not that Definitely. bad. Um, who, who else are we going to see next week then? Uh, of interesting, just quickly, we're going to go, I'm um, just quickly mention a few, mm -hmm. uh, Cosenza Como, um, we're going to have Cittadella Ternana, we're going to have Cagliari Venezia, that's another Serie A, old Serie A teams to, to, to face each other. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Palermo Sutiro, that'll be quite interesting just to see if Sutiro is going to still keep it up. Parma Frosinone, is Parma going to still wake up? Are they going to wake up or are they going to still like once in a while trip? Well, and, and and remember, Frosinone is is right now, I think, on third. And, and yeah, so it's kind and of a game. Parma is, yeah, exactly. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, but it's at Parma, but nevertheless. Uh, Bari Brescia, the double B, I think, is going to be a quite probably the most interesting uh, yeah. match of, 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 the, of, the, of match day seven. You know, I, 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 I wish that I kind of love that they did the old school, like everybody's playing at the same time for the most part thing, because it's, you know, you just kind of the warm and fuzzy feelings of everyone has to go follow their team and that's it. 
and you're listening or you're watching or whatever. Uh, but it's kind of a bummer that some of these games are happening at the same time as, as Genoa Spout because I'm only going to be able to see that stuff um, on demand. So I know, I know. And uh, actually, good that you said that. For us, anyways, it's going to be the first time we're going to watch a match at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yes. Wait, but, first, time, first time this season or first time ever in, in Toronto? Season for us. Yeah, so season, season for us. Before. Okay, well, yeah. it's I know in New York the 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 guys are doing it too. It's great, and so very few times you get to start your day with a beer and a coffee at the same time. I know, right? <laughs> in the last few matches, because the last one is uh, I just want to mention it because of something interesting. But mm-hmm. then we have Perugia Pisa. So Pisa, as we mentioned, talked about a few times, still tr- struggling, but they did a, a actually both Perugia and Pisa have changed their coach. Really. I didn't know that about Perugia. So Pisa went back to the previous one, and I think Perugia just changed it too. I, I could be wrong, but and the last one, roll, you know, drums there. There we have Benevento Ascoli, and who just joined Benevento as their coach? Cannavaro. Really, I, I didn't even see this news. Where have I been sleeping? That's crazy. Fabio Cannavaro has joined um, as as a coach. What a what a Forbidden. crazy! Like, yeah. look at City B. What's happening to City B? That's what I'm my, my, I'm trying to say. We have people. There's a whole. There's Grosso. There's Canavaro. There's um um, uh, people in Zaghi. Like, there's a whole bunch of former. Uh, if you look at Fabregas, if you want to think about it, even from sure. that perspective. Yeah. I mean, st- still, you know. And some major teams there, including uh-huh. us. It's going to be a post-log. Um, it's going to be a challenging one. I, I think it's, by the way, interesting that kind of our last managed um, China um, and some and some team called. No, no, no. Yeah, China was his last kind of gig before. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So last, before we wrap it up, predictions. Go. All right. So, um, you know, a way match. I like your prediction from a lineup perspective with Puskas in there, I think we do score three goals. I think that it's going to be difficult to, um, I know Spal is not exactly an atmosphere place, but I, I think, I think Spal will get a goal themselves. So um, that's my, I think three to one uh, Genoa is my prediction. Okay. So I actually like that. I'm going to say only add a few comments to that. Genoa has so far seven goals for, I think we are below what the expectation is, yeah. what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Only five, I'm going to say only, but it's not really only, but it's a five allowed. And mostly it's because of that Parma game. Um, otherwise I think it's, a, we would be in a better um, solid shape. Um, while Spal, they have 10 goals for, so a, a little bit more than us. And most of them are also coming <laughs> again from, from the Como match from two weeks ago, Fair. but also have um, nine goals against. So by also looking at that, I think the 3-1 is just right spot on. For the first time, I think, since uh, we're match agreeing. seven, and we're agreeing. Wow. Well, this is a good <laughs> sign. I feel like uh you know maybe this is gonna bring some good luck so let's cross your fingers are you gonna put some players to that number uh for the goals i so let's pretend puskas plays i think let's i think he does get a goal uh i think coda gets on the score sheet i think we're gonna see that from him um i i believe it's gonna be spread out across the goal distribution we might see a player on a double um i kind of think we're gonna see another one from Frendra. um i know he's kind of had some unusual goals um, he's not exactly a, a natural goal scorer, but I think if our offense is kind of uh, going back a little bit to the blessing comment, if we're sort of paying off that blessing attitude with the, the way we're approaching the game, you might see a more active in the final third um, front up than maybe you'd see in other instances. So we'll see. No, I, I kind of want to agree with you, but at the same time, my desire says that I want uh, Koda to have uh 
as you said, that the Topieta, the two goals. Yes. And the second one will be in uh, with the hypothesis of having Puskas there. The second one, se- second goal uh, scorer will be him, or vice versa, two for Puskas and one for Koda. Yeah. That's my take. I like it. Pretty sound. All right. So this is a wrap for episode 18. We'd love uh, to, to hear your comments. If you have any suggestions, uh, you can follow us on, on social media, all the three major platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter. Absolutely mm-hmm. uh, reach out to us, ask us questions and whatnot. And we're looking forward to watch the match against Spal. Victorious, let's hope so. And, um, and yeah, and let's uh, uh, stay tuned for next week. And we're going to be back with another special guest. That's Forza right. Genoa. Forza Genoa. Ciao. You've listened to La Lanterna, a spotlight on Italian football, a podcast powered by Genoani Siresta. Thank you for listening and see you next week. <laughs>